And what better time than now for Politics Monday, of course, with NPR's Tamara Keith, co-host of the NPR podcast, and Lisa Lair, politics reporter for The New York Times. Now I get to ask the questions, ladies. It's exciting. <laughs> Let's start with Joe Biden. It's interesting because last week, I know you both reported on, he had a sort of mea culpa about Anita Hill, an emotional moment for him. And now he's got yet another question about how he treats women. It's a large cultural moment, but it's also a politically tricky one. What does this say? What does this say about Joe Biden and how important is it for his chances? And is there a chance of backlash from conservatives who say there's no knowable standard anymore? So politically, what's it mean, Tam? Right. There is no knowable standard anymore. I mean, Democrats have taken the position of zero tolerance, but zero tolerance for what? And, and this is, as with so many of these things, complicated and nuanced. Lucy Flores, in her description of it, is nuanced, uh, saying that she didn't think it was sexual harassment, didn't think it was assault, but she felt uncomfortable that, that he put her in an awkward position. And, and, and then when you, you go to um, uh, Mrs. Carter saying, well, in my case, it wasn't. I didn't feel uncomfortable. Um, there is a difference between the two of them. Uh, Joe Biden was, was close, was friends with the Carters. Um, Lucy Flores is somebody he was campaigning with just that moment. But, you know, I've been, I've covered him uh, out uh, out in the wild over the years where, you know, I, I did a story in 2014. It was not anything remarkable at the time where he kissed a hundred year old grandma uh, and, and went in for a hug. But it, you know, times are different now. Politically, what's it mean, Lisa? I think it actually speaks to the larger, really central question facing Joe Biden should he decide to enter this race, which is, is a political figure who has been in office for 40 years. I mean, he entered the Senate in 1973, before abortion was legal, before the Watergate hearings, before people had VCRs. This was a long time ago. And political mores in the country, and particularly in the Democratic Party, have shifted on a number of issues. Uh, busing, abortion, and certainly standards around gender and consent, and this whole national conversation we're having around those topics right now. So I think the central question he's facing is, can he get right on those issues with where the party is now. And that's what we are about to find out in the next couple weeks. What does this mean for other presidential candidates? Anything? We've got Kirsten Gillibrand and also Kamala Harris, who have uh, overseen staff members in the past that have been found to have to pay recompense for sexual harassment. They've had trouble with that issue. When does this matter to voters? Right, and add them, add Bernie Sanders to that. His campaign in 2016 uh, had issues with sexual harassment. He has apologized for uh, how those things were handled. Uh, he, not his issue, but people he supervised. Um, th this is... You know, this is a conversation that didn't happen four years ago in the presidential campaign, uh, though it was a conversation that uh, did get kicked off in a way by President Trump. And I think we are having this cultural moment surrounding the Me Too, but there is a real political risk here. And the political risk is that the Democratic primary electorate is expected to be a majority female. So these topics will may resonate more with female voters. And that is what all these candidates are playing to. And they're also very cognizant of what happened in the midterms, which is that women's work powered the Democratic Party's gains. Women were, you know, these groundbreaking candidates, but they were also the volunteers. They were the campaign managers. I'm sure you too, like I, went to those rallies and met several PTA moms who were totally, you know, engaged politically. And for the first time, a lot of them. For the first time, because yeah. of the Trump administration. And everyone running in the Democratic field is very aware of those new political dynamics. All right, let's talk to this weekend's dynamic. It was actually a pretty big weekend in politics. And we'll start with the man, the myth, Beto O'Rourke, who had his <laughs> a formal announcement. There it is in El Paso, of course, standing on top of something. Um, it was also another important weekend for um, Mr. O'Rourke and all of the Democrats running because this was the end of the first quarter for political fundraising. We won't get the total numbers. They're not due until April 15th. However, I want to ask you all, how important is political fundraising for this expanding group of Democrats and who's doing well? Well, it is important. Uh, it always has been. But uh, when you're in a field of, you know, a busload of people, it's particularly important to be able to show through your fundraising that you have some amount of grassroots support. It also is important in terms of getting on stage at that, uh, mm -hmm. at those Democratic debates. So uh, Pete Buttigieg, the mayor of South Bend, Indiana, uh, came out early saying, you know, I don't have the full numbers, but I, I have a preliminary number, raised $7 million in the first quarter. Um, and he got out 
out early on this because presumably there will be other candidates with much bigger numbers to come, like uh, Mr. O'Rourke mm. or Bernie Sanders, who's expected to have a really big number. And I also, I don't want to bust up any trade secrets here, but these uh, political, these fundraising numbers are really one of the few actual facts we have mm -hmm. right now in this race. I mean, polls at this point really measure little more than name recognition. So a lot of how we're measuring who's up, who's down, who seems to have some energy has been around media coverage or Twitter or, you know, where they are in these polls that don't measure much. So this is a data point that shows us accurately how much money they're bringing in, how many small donors they have. That gives us some sense of the field. Now, of course, as we learned in 2012 with the Republicans, this could be a race where everyone gets their little moment and Pete Buttigieg has his boomlet and then, you know, it's the question is, do you have the moment at the right time? But this at least gives everyone watching this race a sense of where these candidates stand in terms of actual support compared to each other. And I don't want too much angry email, obviously. Beto O'Rourke is a fun, fundraising juggernaut, you know, right. mean, I'm being respectful toward him, and so is Bernie Sanders, that seem to be at the top of the heap right now. Um, but let's get away from money. Let's talk about issues. I know you were on the campaign trail, um, and you were in Michigan with the president. And I was in Iowa right before and that. You're, what are voters actually talking about in this sort of as D.C. is all obsessed with the Mueller report a bit? Obviously, it's an important report, but what are voters talking about? So I was struck by two things when I was in New Hampshire. The first is that voters are not talking about that report. At least they're not asking candidates about it. They're asking about health care and climate change and school shootings and, you know, big issues that are facing the country that resonate particularly with the Democratic electorate. But the second thing I was struck about, struck by, was that I asked them about it. <laughs> and what I found was that it didn't seem to make a difference what the report actually found, that the Democratic primary electorate was convinced that the president had done something wrong, and whatever the results of the investigation were, that wasn't really going to change their minds, which made me think that that issue is sort of baked in the cake, at least for the primary. General, of course, it's a different ballgame, but that's real long. It's a really long time away still. Tam, you were with two different core right. groups of voters. So it was fascinating, out with the Trump voters, talking to people waiting to get into the president's rally. All of them said they wanted the Mueller report released because they think it'll be exonerating to the president. And they were there to talk about the Mueller report. The day before, I spent uh, an hour hanging out with about uh, interviewing 10 young voters in Iowa. They never brought up Mueller. They never brought up Russia. They never brought up uh, getting, you know, booting the president out of office. They were very focused on uh, not so much on issues, though climate change is something that they brought up, mm -hmm. income inequality, uh, criminal justice reform, things like that. They talked about that. But the, the most important thing to them, and you hear this time and again, is they just want somebody who has that quality that they can't quite name mm -hmm. that will allow them to beat the president, that will let him go head to head with him on the debate stage. The magic dust, I call it. Magic yeah. political dust. Now, here's the point where I was going to attempt an April Fool's joke. I was going to try and say to you, hey, did you hear about this crazy candidate that's going to run April Fool's? I couldn't think of anyone crazy enough for it to be. <laughs> you know, it seems like really anyone can run right now. So I guess I'll just close by saying, hey, did you hear Congress and the president have put aside their differences? <laughs> <laughs> April Fool's, yeah. Anyway. yeah. Thank you guys so much, Tamara, Keith, Lisa Lair. Thank you. You're welcome.